Welcome to the presentation for Module 7. This presentation for Module 7 will discuss disorders of the pituitary gland, specifically the antidiuretic hormone that is secreted from the pituitary gland. Uh, these two disorders are diabetes insipidus and syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. The slide is just a review of the endocrine glands and how they can affect a disorder of them can affect a patient's health, self-image, and a lot of different body systems. Three major components of the endocrine system are the glands, the hormones, and the receptors. All of these have to be functioning appropriately in order for the endocrine system to, to work properly and affect the growth and development of the patient, uh, the metabolic rate, their ability to adapt to stress, etc. Um, the disorders can be within the gland itself, within the release of the appropriate amounts of hormones, or with the places that are the receptor sites for these hormones. Um, it can vary as to the cause of the problem. This presentation is focusing on disorders of the pituitary gland. Remember, the pituitary gland sits in the, um, in the head, in the patient's brain, near the brain. Um, it is a very pea-sized gland. It's in the inferior aspect of the brain. It's often called the master gland as it has, it uh, produces multiple, multiple hormones. Um, posterior lobe has oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. The anterior lobe uh, has, is secreting at least six different hormones that affect growth and development. For this specific presentation, we're gonna talk about disorders of the pituitary gland, and these disorders are associated with antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone plays a large role in the uh, water loss. They, the target organs are the kidneys, and this hormone is meant to regulate fluid and electrolyte balance in a patient. It also regulates blood pressure by um, regulating fluid volume on board. Antidiuretic means that it um, prevents the patient from ridding itself of fluid. As you know, the word diuresis means to get rid of fluid. Antidiuretic means that it holds on to fluid. Um, diabetes insipidus is a condition where there is not enough antidiuretic hormone, and so the patient loses excessive amounts of fluid. Lots of different causes can, ca can make this happen. Um, it is rare. Um, sometimes it's just a familial or an idiopathic cause, which means we really don't know why a patient has it. Um, it can be secondary to an intracranial trauma, something that affects the pituitary gland. Sometimes infections, if they have some kind of a brain surgery, it can affect their pituitary just because if it causes any swelling. Sometimes it can be just temporary due to a trauma. Um, once a patient is treated effectively for their trauma or their neurosurgery, the patient may um, not have the problem any longer. So it can be temporary. It can be long term if it's somebody who has it just an idiopathic reason. There are medications that can lead to diabetes insipidus. Lithium is probably the most famous. Lithium is a um, mental health medication that patients may be on that can cause this. Again, that cause may be temporary. We would have to change their medications and hopefully that would fix the diabetes insipidus in those patients. This is just a good visual summary slide for a patient with diabetes insipidus. You have your reasons, some of your reasons listed here on the top. Um, so basically the pituitary gland turns off um, antidiuretic hormone and basically what happens is that allows for water loss. Here's the specific um, signs and symptoms that the patient will present with initially. Up to 20 liters of urine a day. That's a large amount. So it's excessive, excessive voiding. Very clear urine. It's not concentrated at all. Um, that's why the specific gravity and the osmolarity in the urine are low. Patient is hypovolemic and they're thirsty because they're losing water. They get tachycardic, of course, and a low blood pressure due to the fact that they've lost so much volume. Here's nursing care associated with diabetes insipidus. Got to monitor their fluid eyes and nose very, very, very closely. 
We replace fluids as needed. Monitor their neurostatus. Um, what happens with them is they end up with a fluid and electrolyte imbalance. And we'll talk about that in the next few slides. Diabetes insipidus is a water loss problem caused by either a, an, a deficiency in the antidiuretic hormone or inability of the kidneys to respond to it. Um, it is classified as a nephrogenic, which means it um, could be your kidneys, it can be drug-related, it can be primary or secondary, depending on whether the problem is caused by insufficient production of antidiuretic hormone or the inability of the kidneys to respond. And as we said, is the job of antidiuretic hormone to balance fluid and electrolytes for the patients. Basically, it's a, a good way that we balance our fluid volume. Um, if we have someone who is losing too much fluid, the pituitary, a normal functioning pituitary gland should send some more antidiuretic hormone down so that it'll hold on to fluid for us. If we seem to have excessive amounts of fluid on board, then the pituitary gland should sense that and then not send any more antidiuretic hormone. Cardinal sign of diabetes insipidus is essentially that increased urine output and, and it's like a massive loss of fluid without antidiuretic hormone. The patient presents as being very thirsty. They um, they have dry mouth, they have a low blood pressure, and, a, and they are tachycardic. The urine becomes very dilute with a low specific gravity and low osmolarity. That means, low osmolarity means that there is not any solutes in it. And you have to take into consideration that the patient's blood tests are just the opposite of the urine test. Because everything is being taken out in the urine, the patient's blood becomes um, less dilute Sorry, the patient's blood becomes very thick and it, um, it is less dilute. So that means that their electrolytes are um, higher. So they will have a hypernatremia. That means their sodium levels are high. Be sure to review in your book the key features listed of diabetes insipidus. This is just a continued look at the patient, how they will present with diabetes insipidus. It's your job as a nurse to think of all the interventions that you would need to do to monitor this patient, such as monitor eyes and nose very closely, um, monitor how thirsty they are, provide them with ways to quench their thirst. Um, if it's nocturia, it's going to be a safety thing perhaps if they're up multiple times during the night getting up to the bathroom, and then they're fatigued and then they're dehydrated which can cause confusion, especially in older adults, it can cause confusion. So those are some nursing specific things that you need to think about with those patients. Essentially with diabetes insipidus, we have to figure out the cause. Is it a medication? Is it a brain issue? Is it a kidney issue? Do they have kidney damage and they're not responding to it? Um, once we find that out, we can treat it appropriately. We can give patients um, supplements of antidiuretic hormone in the form of desmopressin acetate, which is also known as DDAVP. It's a synthetic form of vasopressin that can be given orally or intranasally. Um, people who have idiopathic causes of diabetes insipidus will have to take it lifelong, um, and most patients will have to essentially take it until the cause can be treated if it's a temporary cause. Um, basically, this medication has to be monitored and managed very closely. Um, episodes of stress can have their, their dose may need to be changed. So um, they have to kind of monitor themselves as far as if they're, if, they're, if they're putting out a lot more urine, they, need to take, they might need to take an extra dose of their DDAVP. Um, and teach polyuria and polydipsia are indications for, and for a need for another dose. And that can happen in times of extra stress and things like that. So this, this medication works well, but the patient is going to have to be educated very well on how to titrate it. They will have multiple, multiple um, return visits to their physician, and they need to know that they need to call if they feel uncomfortable with titrating this med. Again, just talking about nursing care of a patient with diabetes insipidus. 
Um, monitoring that INO, monitoring those vital signs, and monitoring for safety are probably the priority um, highlights for a patient who has diabetes insipidus. The fluid volume deficit and the electrolyte imbalances makes that patient extremely at risk for um, falling for um, further complications related to it. So patient teaching is going to include teach the patient to monitor fluid intake and output, restrict sodium in their meal plan, instruct the patient to administer the desmopressin by nasal if, or by mouth, advise the patient about possible side effects of the medication such as headache, Tell them to report weight gain because it may mean that the dosage is too high. You really, really have to kind of make sure you understand fluid balance um, in this situation so that you can help educate a patient. Um, recurrence of polyuria, um, as reflected on the INO, would may indicate that their dose is too low, so they need to report that. So think about that as a nurse, what you need to tell them to report. Advise them to wear a medical alert bracelet. That's always a good idea. Provide written instructions on how to and when to use their medications and what they should call for. Moving on to syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Um, many of people think of this as a neuro issue, and that's because it's typically related to a problem that's affecting the brain and the pituitary gland. Um, it is the opposite of diabetes insipidus. It means that um, there is too much antidiuretic hormone being secreted by the pituitary, and this causes the absolute opposite effects of diabetes insipidus. This now means that the patient is holding on to too much fluid, and they will become fluid overloaded. Um, so make sure that you understand that this is an overload of fluid. Interesting thing about syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, it often is secondary to um, problems such as malignancies, pulmonary disorders. These are listed in your book. Um, it's some lung cancers it can be associated with, and that's because some of these organs secrete um, especially these tumors secrete triggers for the pituitary gland to release antidiuretic hormone, which is, again, it's inappropriate. A lot of tumors um, known as small cell lung cancer is one of the uh, most common causes I've seen. Non-Hodgkin's can cause release of triggers for the pituitary gland to release antidiuretic hormone. I've known some patients who are diagnosed with small cell lung cancer due to the fact that they are showing signs and symptoms of a, a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone and we can't find any other reason. So they look to their lungs and then they're diagnosed with this, the lung cancer. Other reasons, um, recent head trauma um, and some drugs can cause uh, signs and symptoms of syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Opioids, uh, and they're listed in your book here, um, some tricyclic antidepressants can cause it. So this patient will look just the opposite of your diabetes insipidus patient. They are holding on to fluid. They're going to be puffy. Um, they're going to be hyponatremic. So the reason their sodium level is low is because all the fluid that they're holding on to is diluting their sodium. So if this is your patient's vascular system. Um, they've got a large amount of fluid and the sodium that's in their body is getting diluted. So it makes them appear to have a hyponatremia. The important thing for you to understand this, this hyponatremia has nothing to do with their diet. It's all about the fluid that they have on board. In order to fix this hyponatremia, we got to get the fluid off. So we got to pull this fluid in and then they, they won't appear to be so hyponatremic. Make sure you understand that. It has nothing to do with diet. It's all about fluid overload. So the treatment for that is not to put them on a sodium restricted diet. You put them on a fluid restricted diet. Okay, make sure you understand that.
Again, here are the steps for syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. You restrict their fluid, promote the excretion of water, find the cause, essentially, um, that's causing the inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. And there are some medications that we can give to interfere with the action of antidiuretic hormone. Fluid restriction is essential because fluid intake further dilutes plasma sodium levels. Low sodium levels, make sure you understand what that means. That can cause a severe neurologic condition if someone has extremely low sodium levels. The other thing you need to know is what a normal sodium level is. Typically, most labs, it's 135 to 145. So we're talking like sodium levels of like 108, 110, things like that. Those are severely low sodium levels that will cause a patient to have a stroke if we are not careful. The other piece of that is you can you have to um, make sure that you replace sodium very slowly. Hypertonic saline may be given in the event that someone's sodium levels become very critically low. Make sure you understand what a hypertonic saline means. That's usually a 0.3% and we give it slow. Um, because we don't want to um, just load the patient up with a bunch of um, sodium fluid. we got to give it about 50 an hour, 50 milliliters an hour over about a 10-hour period um, to slowly fix their sodium levels. If not, we'll cause a shift in fluid that could be life-threatening. The big thing that you have to understand if somebody's sodium levels are low is you have to maintain their safety because they're going to get confused and they're going to fall. So be very, very careful with those patients. Diuretics may be utilized in the event that a patient is not too hyponatremic. We have to be very careful. So if they um, have syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, um, we may use diuretics. Um, if the sodium levels are near normal um, and the patient looks like they're showing signs and symptoms of heart failure due to the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. But we can't give it if they have really, really low sodium levels. We can only give it if their sodium levels are not too bad. I pretty much said most of this stuff in the last slide, but safety, safety, safety is a big thing with these patients. Fluid restriction not diet restriction for these patients. It's a fluid problem. Syndrome of, anti, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone is a fluid problem. We gotta fix the fluid. So your eyes and nose, your neuro checks, if you give that hypertonic saline, you're gonna give it very slowly and very carefully monitoring your patient closely along the way. This is just a good slide that shows you the difference between the two. Um, and as you can see, in most cases, they are absolutely the opposite. The interesting thing is they both will have excessive thirst. Um, and that this the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, um, they feel thirsty because they um, are diluted. So way, they can't have any fluid, though. So the problem with them is you can have them chew gum, suck on ice chips, suck on hard candy to help with their thirst because you can't give them fluid. These guys, you can give them some fluid, so uh, that's how you would fix their thirst. But there are other ways to help people with a dry mouth, and that is frequent mouth care and um, hard candy or chewing gum can help with that. Again, just another visual slide. Hopefully, this the reason I put this up here is some people have a hard time grasping the sodium levels um, in patients with SIADH or uh, diabetes insipidus. So hopefully this is just kind of helps you understand what your patient is going to look like. That concludes the presentation for Module 7 on diabetes insipidus and syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. There's multiple questions here in the remainder of the PowerPoint for you to review and check your answers in the comment section.